I was an ASIO kid from 1953, the day I was born. We were kind of trained from the time we were born that you didn't talk about anything to anyone. We knew all the time that we were helping Australia stay safe and that that was Dad's job and Dad's job was the most important thing in our family and we were not allowed to slip up. If my father took one of us into the ASIO building, that was a massive treat. You'd get in the lift, the floor was not on the lift, so all the buttons on the lift, it wasn't there. So the lift driver would take you to this secret floor and you would walk into this secret world the, with the, the polished timber and the old desks and offices everywhere and all the doors were shut. My father had this tiny little camera. Cameras were great big huge mummers in those days, but Dad had this tiny little camera, had a tiny little dictaphone. We would have to record people. What people did you see? Where were they? Who were they talking to? What did they look like? And Dad would say, OK, come on, we're going out number plating. we jump into the car, and it was like musical chairs. You know, one of us would be in the front seat one time, we'd go around the block, and then we'd change our top or put a hat on, and we'd pick cars, get the number plates, then we'd drive around the block, and we'd stop, and Dad would record the number plates. To us kids, this was a game. So in my view, we were looking at communists. So it was the Red Peril and the enemy were the communists. There were regular houses that we would go and monitor. Dad came home one day and said, we're going on holidays. You know, it was very exciting. And then they said, this, there's another family who's going to be coming with us. And that was the Petrovs. The Petrovs had defected. They were Russian spies and they had sent them to us to keep them safe during the Olympics. We always called Mrs. Petrov Peewee, and I didn't call him anything because I was just absolutely, totally freaked out by him. Peewee was just so beautiful. She was so lovely to me, and I understand that no one knew where they were. But we knew. I think the moment I realised that life in the Doherty family was really different from other people's lives, was in grade one at school. Very early on in the piece, the teacher asked all of us what our fathers did, and I didn't, I didn't know how to answer the question. And so when I went home, I said to Mum, what do I say? And she said, oh, well, tell them that your father works for the government. But I was also terribly disappointed. I wanted someone exciting for a father, like a milkman or a policeman. But I did realise in that moment that other kids didn't have to keep secrets. We never talked to each other because a secret is a secret. I did not know who my father was. He, he died when I was 17. He was present, but even when he was present, he was working. So I wanted to find out who he was, what his ethics were, how he, within his own body, you know, justified, balanced everything that he was doing. And, you know, he died at 47, so clearly he didn't do such a great job or he had very poor health. I know it sounds crazy. I accepted that the role that we were playing was that Dad was dead. But the whole time I also accepted that there was a very great possibility that he wasn't. This was just another theatre of engagement that he was involved in. And I sat down with my mum and I just said to her, Dad really is dead, isn't he? And she said, yes, darling, he's always been dead. My brother and sister told me that they didn't remember anything. And I just think we have this compartment in our brain where all of this is locked away. But once Sandra could get us to open those floodgates, oh my God, the sense of relief. We talked about the night my father died. We'd never talked about that, ever. And we're, you know, we're all in our 60s. The rules were safety. And I, as an adult, am gobsmacked that we never slipped up.